Welcome, everyone. Uh, well, let's start with our class. We are looking at uh, the poem, great Anglo-Saxon epic poem, by the name of Beowulf. Uh, so, in, and in doing that, we're retreating a bit uh, chronologically. Uh, Dante was written circa 1300, and uh, Beowulf is written sometime. Uh, scholars disagree on this sometime between this uh, 700 to 1100 or around a th year 1000 in, in that range. Not exactly sure and we're not sure who the poet was either. Uh, but it, uh, the reason I took it out of chrono chronological order is because uh, I thought I would put Dante with Virgil right or near enough to Virgil that there was some sort of a sense of continuity here. Uh, Beowulf seems to appear um, it's coming from a different uh, area of Europe with a different tradition and uh, different conventions and cultural expectations. So now we're dealing in, uh, the, it's an Anglo-Saxon epic. So Anglo-Saxon is the language uh, that was spoken in Britain before the Norman conquest in 1066. And the Normans were uh, from that area, Normandy and France, and they brought with them uh, the French language and Latin and so forth, and that changed the English language when, when they came. But this was written before that period, and it is in itself a great poem. And uh, it is uh, now put on English syllabi uh, and has been for, uh, gosh, not quite a century now, uh, largely due to the efforts of this man whom you might recognize or you might not, and if you don't recognize him, you'll know his name, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was the uh, uh, professor of Anglo-Saxon literature at Oxford University, and he argued that uh, the uh, English tradition had its own epic and its own rich literary heritage that ought to be uh, understood and explored and appreciate unto itself. And so he almost single-handedly hand ensured that Beowulf was brought into the canon of English literature, even though it's written in Anglo-Saxon. And he argued, in fact, that Anglo-Saxon is a necessity for those who study English literature. Note that we have not followed his uh, understanding here. We don't require people to learn Anglo-Saxon to do our uh, English degree. They don't at Oxford anymore either, but they did at one point. Um, uh, but he argues, and I think there's, there's some substance there to the argument that uh, there is a, uh, the language is the foundation for the understanding that follows in, in English. At any rate, uh, it is the greatest achievement in uh, Old English literature, so Anglo-Saxon or Old English we could call it, and it's the earliest uh, European vernacular epic. So it's written in a language other than Latin or Greek. Uh, the events it depicts are somewhere around the 6th century, but it's written much later. And it's, what's interesting about it is it's, the author is manifestly Christian. And, and I'll come to the marking uh, things in the text that will make it clear that that is the case. But the setting is not. The setting is pagan. And that makes it uh, an interesting uh, commentary because it's a Christian commenting to some degree on an age that has now uh, passed away uh, in the cultural memory, but no longer there and uh, because of Christendom. And the character of Beowulf, although he is an Anglo-Saxon hero, and I said that the cultural expectations of that area of Northern Europe are different from those of, uh, of Southern Europe and, and uh, uh, of the Latin world. Uh, the, the poet uh, or the figure Beowulf seems in many ways to my mind to bear the marks of having Christian characteristics. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to that when I come to it. But um, uh, let me talk a little bit about the expectations in, in Norse literature and so forth. Norse literature and um, culture is very pessimistic. 
there's a sense that uh, the world is uh, in the throes of a war in the heavens. There's a cosmic war going on the same way that there is in the, in the Greek and Latin epics. Uh, but that there's an, inev an inevitable doom that is coming. It, it can't be avoided. Uh, it's celebrated in uh, its great literary works. And Tolkien loved this literature, Norse sagas and so forth, the poetic Edda, uh, among other things. So if you were an Anglo-Saxon scholar, you would almost invariably also have to read uh, Norse literature. So it's the sort of uh, old Icelandic, the sort of uh, work that is now read in Iceland. It's uh, very similar to the current uh, Icelandic language as well. Um, but in that work, there are lots of supernatural creatures, so m monsters uh, and uh, the sorts of, of characters that we encountered in ancient Greek literature. So monstrous creatures, but not just in the underworld, but also on the earth. And, uh, and the Beowulf poet, whoever he was, uh, seems to be evoking that sort of world, the same world that we see in Tolkien's own Lord of the Rings, where there are hobbits and dwarves and elves and so forth. So um, what we would call mythological characters. So they, they tend to be there. Um, the, uh, the only surviving manuscript here, by the way, which is burned at the edges, is, uh, is uh, in the British Library. It's called the Beowulf Manuscript, and it was discovered only, I think, in the 19th century. It's not that it wasn't known before, but it's not, much, it's not influential per se on uh, uh, the English Renaissance and so forth. No references to Beowulf, to my mind. It's, a, it's an old manuscript. Uh, one that has survived, obviously, it, it would have its own history. This manuscript is burnt around the edges. There's one left in it. It's a, a poem about an ancient world that's now passed away, written by a Christian author reflecting on it, trying to maintain and write something of the epic nature of the deeds done by this great uh, hero, Beowulf. Um, the poem itself falls into two parts, if you're reading it. We're going to take two classes to do that. It begins in Denmark. So I don't know if you know Europe very well. I'll put a little map up here uh, just in case. Oh, I haven't put that on there. So I'll just bring that up. This is so slow. Every time I have to say. Technology is a wolf map. So let's just do this one here since it's there we go. So oh it, it is there behind me. Okay. So this is Denmark here. Uh, also and uh, the northern park of Denmark is known as Jutland or Jutland, and these are the Jutes and the Danes. The Yats, who are referred to repeatedly, are, are southern Swedish. Uh, often, uh, many times, the, the kings will be the same king in Denmark and, and Sweden historically. But that it's taking place here. Now, I said it's an Anglo-Saxon epic. The Angles and the Saxons are, are coming from this area of the world. And uh, as I say, Britain is over here. So the language is about a, a country over here. Now, many of the uh, there's a great deal of cultural influence from here because of the, the Vikings and the invasions of, uh, in Norway going over across to England as well. So there are raids on lots of interaction between these cultures. But the, the setting is not in England, even though it's written in Anglo-Saxon. It's in Denmark slash Sweden. Uh, but it begins in that Denmark, and it begins with a, in a mead hall. A mead hall is a place where mead would be droke, drunk, and mead is a honeyed a fermented honey. It's like a type of alcohol. Uh, the monks would have brewed this alongside beer. Uh, but this is a great hall, and it's a hall by the name of Hurot, H-E-O-R-O-T. And it represents a, a, a civilizational achievement. It's a, a place of gathering. If you think of uh, the Lord of the Rings and uh, uh, 
the king of the great of the golden hall what's his name again um just drawn a blank it's in the in the two towers that epic the or the second installment what's the name of the king anyone know Aragorn. sorry Aragorn. no 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 not Aragorn the uh the king who's possessed and throws out the possession never mind anyway that depiction of a, a world of of quasi knights uh and a uh living uh, riding horses and uh, singing songs in a long hall and drinking and celebrating great deeds and that sort of setting, the same sort of setting that you can probably imagine in uh, the Odyssey where people will gather around long tables, a story is, set, is told or sung and uh, men are drinking and enjoying it but t tales of great heroic deeds are being told. That's how it begins. So it's a place of celebration, of achievement, of honor. And, uh, and yet this place, Herat, has been ravaged for 12 years by a evil monster by the name of Grendel. And Grendel has been doing monstrous things, not only assaulting Herat, but taking off warriors from that hall and eating them. This is a monster. It's not just killing them, he's eating them. And in order to deal with this problem, there, a, a young man from the Yats by the name of Beowulf, so he's over in Sweden, but he's allied to uh, the king here by, a, uh, by an, a bondage of kinship and of, of fidelity and oath that was sworn. He comes across to deal with the problem. He's heard about the problem and he comes to the rescue. So this is a strong young man who is coming right in the nick of time when Herat is, is threatened to be destroyed by this monster uh, and he promises to cleanse uh, the kingdom of this terrible creature. So uh, uh, well, that's the first part and that's the part largely we're going to deal with today. Um, there will be three monsters by the way and I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the three but the three monsters are Grendel and then when he takes care of Grendel, Grendel's mother so he thought it was bad, Grendel was bad. He's getting his mother upset after you're taking it. And Grendel's mother is worse than Grendel, more uh, terrifying. And then the third and final trial that he faces, the worst of all, is that of a dragon. And uh, the dragon uh, challenge, the quest at the end to deal with the dragon, takes place at chronologically at quite a distance from the early battle. So when he battles Grendel and his mother, he's a young man, full in, his, in the strength of his youth. When he comes to face off against the dragon, he is now a king and he's been on the throne for decades. He's old, he's an old man. He's, he has little strength left in him, but he rides out nonetheless. Theoden is his name, King Theoden of Rohan. I knew it would come to me eventually. Gosh. People don't know their Lord of the Rings? Oh, wow. We can remedy that as well. Um, but that's how it begins. And he will begin with a test of strength. Now, when he does that, it seems to me that, as I say, in the, in the Anglo-Saxon world and the Nor Norse world, there's a sense of doom and gloom. Uh, and, and, the, and the hero would be marked by that as well. But that's not the portrait of Beowulf. Beowulf seems far more um, optimistic as a hero. Um, and in fact, uh, the first mention of Beowulf in the poem tells us that God had sent him for a comfort to the people. So he's sent by God. And why? Not for his own glory, which Achilles would have done, and the Norse epic tradition would, but as a comfort to the people. So he was sent by God. There's a providential ordering, and that marks the whole poem. And, um, and Hrothgar, who is the king here in uh, of the Danes, 
uh, praises his mother, saying, Lo, a woman who has borne such a son among the peoples, if she yet lives, may th say that the ancient Lord was gracious to her in the birth of her son. So that sort of language of, of grace and providence is not uh, characteristic of the pagan world. So it's a Christian poet inserting uh, anachronistic ideas into the epic, <laughs> epic tradition here. And we'll see further features of that, but among other things, we're going to find that Grendel is an offspring of Cain. Right? Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve who slew his brother and was banished or, or went into exile and, uh, and apparently now lives, and he lives in exile, and so the offspring of Cain are these monsters, Grendel and his mother and so forth, and they are cut off from civilization and they're angry. And their hostility is not only of Cain, but it's a sort of a demonic hostility. It's a hostility between the civilized world uh, governed and ruled by God and his providence and a monstrous demonic world uh, of, of creatures that are envious and want to do nothing but to destroy. They hate the light and they hate the laughter and they hate the fact that they are excluded from society, but they're solitary creatures. So in the same way we saw when we looked at the Odyssey and those creatures, uh, the Cyclops, they lived in, in solitary lives. They didn't have any communal gatherings. There wasn't a hirat there. There was no communal buildings. There were no community activities. They lived in isolation. They didn't recognize hospitality. In the same way we see here, that's true of Grendel as well. There's no hospitality, they don't recognize, they don't recognize the rule of law, they don't recognize the, the need to obey any legislation. They are figures that look after themselves and they're portrayed as monstrous in every respect, not just in character, but literally these are physical monsters. So it begins with these words. Now this is the translation from Heaney, which I, I asked you to get, and I will uh, put it on the screen in front of you, but I'm wondering, that, does your translation have the Anglo-Saxon there alongside it at all in any place? It does at the right at the outset, right? And I'm not gonna read it here, but you can hear it read online. But what I would like you to note is the way it's written on the page with two columns. Um, that's characteristic of Anglo-Saxon poetry. It's, it's this um, idea of, of symmetry between the two parts. It's not just rhyming, although it does have a sort of rhyming here. It's the rhyming of alliteration. So one of the, uh, the things you'll note about even uh, Heaney's translation is he tries to preserve the alliteration of the original epic in his translation. So he says, so the spear Danes in days gone by and the kings who ruled them have courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was Shield Shiafson, scourge of many tribes. Now he's managed to do it there with the three S's. Uh, throughout the uh, Beowulf poets there uh, verse, every line has more or less three words that will alliterate. And that, they, they love the alliteration, very characteristic of Anglo-Saxon poetry. And also the, as I say, the, the division there in the line. Now, I, I can't expand on this here, but it's characteristic in English poetry that there's an, a, a sort of a pause in the middle of a line. Even in old hymns, uh, which most of us don't sing anymore. I sing them in my church, but most churches don't sing old hymns. Uh, there is a pause in the middle of the line. It can sometimes be put a, as, a, as a comma, but sometimes it's just a, a, a breath. And, it, and the music will fit alongside that. That works very well with English, the English language. So you noted when we did uh, Dante last time that it, he used terza rima, so there was an end rhyme and the threefold end rhyme, right? So it A, B, A, B, C, B, C. Uh, this is a different way of punctuating a poem and a different way of rhyming. The rhyming is on the first syllable, not on the last. Right? When we think of rhyme, we tend to think of the ending of the words. That bling thing, that's a rhyme, right? Sing of the ring, two rhymes, right? And it's the end rhyme, but alliteration is a rhyme at the beginning of the 
word. And Anglo-Saxon particularly delights in that type of rhyme, the of alliteration, the very first part of it. Uh, and you'll notice that when we come to our next poem as well, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. It's, it uses the same patterns of alliteration and to some degree uh, of the prosody as well. But um, I, 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 my Anglo-Saxon has fallen into such disuse, I'm not even going to uh, venture to read this. But if you just look at the top of the line, in the second line, Gomen gliof denes ne god havok, geon sail swinged on se swifta mir, se se se. So it's S S S G G G right at the beginning. Uh, but he begins with a prologue and he tells the rise of the Danish nation at the outset. So he begins with a beginning and where he came from and where this tribe came from. And I'll pick it up in line uh, 12 here. He says there, he, he, he concludes, it says, that was one good king. Afterward, a boy child was sent to shield, a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. Beowulf. Direct invocation of God and the direct uh, expression of the purpose for which he was sent. He was sent to be a comforter to his people. Now again, these are uh, heavily redolent of Christ. Comfort. He sent a comforter to his people. If you know the uh, um, Bible at all or any of uh, English songwriting, uh, the idea that Christ is the comforter. But he was sent by God to the nation. He knew what they had thold, what they had suffered. The long times and the troubles they'd come through without a leader. So the Lord of life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. So we're not dealing with a, uh, a polytheistic world. There's one God, and he's the almighty God, and he sent a man in the midst of the suffering of his people to be a comfort. Now, these are, these are not Anglo-Saxon themes characteristic of the pagan world, and they're not characteristic of the Norse world. They are Christian themes inserted into a pagan world still. And we can talk about why that happens, but it's clear that this is the case. But he, and he made this man renowned. Shielded fathered a famous son. Beowulf's name was known throughout the North. And a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterward in age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. What does it mean to hold the line? Do you understand the phrase? A line of battle. Uh, if you've watched the uh, Lord of the Rings movies, when your enemies, your foes are charging at you, or if you're going to charge at them, you don't charge singly. That's the way you get cut down and destroyed. You march in a line so that the, the person beside you, whether he's, on, he's mounted or standing on foot, can come to your aid. So there, it's a line of battle, and they move. They march together and stay together, but to hold the line, because in the th with the threat of an enemy upon you, the tendency is to to turn and flee. And they're going to stick with him because they trust him. And this theme of trust and fidelity is also strong in the poem. It begins with God himself, who's, who's faithful and has sent him as a comfort. But it's also true of Beowulf and his men. And it's also characteristic of the, this world, of the, the Germanic world. The idea of fidelity and troth and I'll put this word down here, although it's not so prominent in this poem as it will be in the Gowan poem. This word troth, let me pull this down. Uh, which is a word that's rarely used these days. It's occasionally known by, by some, but not many. If it is used, it's in terms of plighting your troth. To plight your troth is to give your word. It's referred to the marital vows. You're going to give your word. You're making a covenant, a solemn oath before God and all these witnesses. That, will you take this woman to be your wife? Will you take this man? Right? And these are, this is your, your 
oath before God and it's a solemn covenant that you will not break. This happens to be the case in Beowulf as well, but it's not just between, in fact, it's not even really mentioned between marital couples, it's mentioned between a lord and his vassal. And when this happens, the lord or the king, the oaths are given and rings are bestowed. Again, if you've read the Lord of the Rings, the rings, the rings are symbols of, uh, of covenant. So when you get married, you exchange a ring. I never wear rings. I don't like rings on my fingers. I sometimes I play that I, when I think about it. But it's a symbol of that covenant bond. And in this world, it, they are given by lords to their vassals, and the va vassals vow to come to the defense of their lord, and the lord promises to provide and care for them likewise in provision of, of goods and of, uh, of arms and of land and so forth. So there are oaths that have been given and these oaths are what are going to sustain Beowulf in the initial battles against Grendel and Grendel's mother. Although we're gonna find that in the end, Beowulf is largely having to fight on his own. And when we conclude the poem, in the final battle, and I'll mention more about this when we come to the fight with the dragon, what thing, one thing that we're going to note is that even though Beowulf is king and has been reigning for decades and has many people who, who have bl been blessed by the prosperity from, his, uh, from a good king, when he goes to meet the dragon, th his men desert him. He's left. An old man, defenseless against the dragon except for one one sticks with him we'll, we'll come to that but there's a there's an element of infidelity there the breaking of an oath the turning of their backs and yet the man the, the king does not turn his back on his people we'll, we'll, we'll come to that next time it, 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 these are great uh, splendid themes but Baal, ba but this idea that he uh, gives freely while his father lives so that afterwards in age when fighting starts steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. So there's wise counsel given here as well. When you're young be virtuous, do good things, give of yourself Give of your means, whatever you have. Do things for others. Don't just look after your own interests because when you get older and the fights come, whatever nature they are, you will need companions around you. Here it's a physical fight. There it's in our life probably not so much. But you will need friends when the times are tough. Make your friendships early and, and, and do them by being generous. And this is again an angle, this is again a Germanic uh, virtue. Not mentioned amongst the, uh, the Greeks there in, in the Latin world, not so much. Generosity, hospitality, yes. Generosity, not quite to the same degree. But um, I'll, I'll pick it up uh, there. I'd like to spend more time on that, but I, I need to get through this a little bit. Let's come to the attack on Herat. Now, this is line 86. Maybe actually just a description of Herat here. Um, yeah, I need to do this, sir. 64. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks, young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall building. He handed down, or and a bit like Solomon, right? He's become, he's, he's become rich, he's become wise. And now he's decided that he's going to build and consolidate his rule. And he handed down orders for men to work on a great mead hall meant to be a wonder of the world forever. So it's not just a place to gather and have fun and be entertained. It's meant to be a display that others will come to and admire. It's a monument. It's a, a testament to civic mindedness, to public mindedness. Note in our day that public buildings are almost never built. And when they're built, they're ugly. They're, 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 they're for a purpose. They're functional, but they're not meant to last for 
millennia. Look at the cathedrals in Europe. Large, beautiful uh, testimonies to something. Well, it's to God by the people there. They've meant it to be a lasting legacy. We don't build anything like that anymore. But that is, and that's to some degree, a reflection of our view of the impermanence of the world. We want things to change. We want them to get better. We're committed to progress, which means that we don't want things to last more than a couple of decades because we'll want to tear them down and build a new one. People lament that things aren't made, or aren't uh, built to last anymore. Well, they're, they're purposely obsolescent. If you have a house that's 100 years old, people are in awe of the fact that you have such an ancient house. Well, if you go over to Europe, there are houses that have been there for five, six centuries. I'm talking about houses now. They were built to last. Um, and Herat was the name of this place. He had settled on it, whose utterance was law. There, that's also interesting. So it's marked by, uh, uh, by rule and godly rule at that. It, it, uh, law demarcates a moral boundary. And so it wasn't just a rule, it was a, a rule of order and, and morality. Nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. Torques are golden ba bands around the neck, but the rings, as I say, all of these things are symbols of not only their um, prosperity, but their, the fact that there's a civilization and a blessedness which is being spread. So it's a symbol of shalom. This is a place of, place of, of the blessing of God. And he's a good king. And the hall towered. So it's not a king that's rich, enriching himself. He's not a prince uh, who is spending his time making himself uh, richer and richer and more and more famous. It's, this, it's the kingdom. He's doing it for the benefit of all. The hall towered its gables wide and high and awaiting a barbarous burning. That's how the this, this story turns right there. So at the point when it all seems well, all of this was for the purpose of being burnt down. That doom abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws, the bloodlust rampant. Now it's unleashed among in-laws referring to Cain. We're going to come to Cain in a second. He's going to mention, as I said, who Grendel is and where he came from. But he's talking about it not in relation only to Grendel, but in relation to mankind. There is a problem with all human achievements, and that is sin. He doesn't call it sin. But there's an endemic problem in human nature that will not allow things to remain peaceful or lasting for long without corrosion. And that's it. It's, it's on, among in-laws, the bloodlust, rampant. And then I'll pick it up here, 86. Then a powerful demon. A prowler through the dark nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skillful poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings. How the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves, and quickened life in every other thing that moved. So times were pleasant for people there, until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of the grim demon haunting the marches, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. Fens are swamps. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the Creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the Eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty made him anathema, and out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants, too, who strove with God 
time and again until he gave them their reward. So that's the, uh, on the one hand, he set the early beginning of a good king and he's mentioned the suffering that they've had, only mentioned it, but they, the, then the emphasis shifts to Herat and the establishment of this peaceful reign of communal community and civilization, and yet it's invariably going to end, and the reason why is because there's an enmity in the world. Just think of the Lord of the Rings. Something is awoken in the dark. The, the sleepless malice has arisen again. It's popped its head up. It never went away. It's been banished to the hinterlands, and now it's coming, and it's, it is not willing to live and let live. It wants to destroy because it's angry at the Almighty. But the Almighty that's described there is also clearly the uh, creator of Genesis, just the references, right? So again, a clear Christian poet, uh, and yet set in a world where there are monsters, ogres, elves, evil phantoms, and even giants. Told in much of ancient literature, I said the Greek world seems to talk about similar things. Actually, almost every culture does, which I find interesting. You get the same thing in North American literature, uh, African literature, Asian literature, South America, it's ubiquitous. Um, at any rate, uh, so we'll pick up the story. So after Grenf nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the ring Danes were settling into it after their drink. And there he came upon them, a company of the best asleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow, because they've had so much to drink. Suddenly then, the God-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed 30 men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. So you get the size of, he drags off 30 men, and not just any men, these are heroes, these are strong men, 30 of them have been grabbed, taken back to his lair and butchered. Then as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail was over, their feast was over. They wept to heaven and mourned until morning. Their mighty prince, the storied leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast at the demon's trail. In deep distress, he was numb with grief, but got no respite, for one night later, merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right. That's the poet's conclusion, 144. He ruled in defiance of right. So it's not just an enemy, like another tribe. He does it explicitly against what is good and what is just in order to express his anger at God. So there's, it's an explanation of evil here. Not just, it's not just an enemy of some sort. It's not just an opponent, opposing tribe. There's something more at work here. In defiance of right, one against all, until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For 12 winters, seasons of woe, the Lord of the Shielding suffered under his load of sorrow. And so before long, the news was known over the whole world. Sad lays were sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and unrelenting feud, nothing but war, how he would never parley or make peace with any day, nor stop his death dealing, nor pay the death price. Now the death price is that if you slay somebody in, in the Germanic tradition, you could pay them Weirgeld, which is a money for the loss to the family. And this would, this would prevent civil war from ensuing. 
because uh, when uh, in those tribes, if you slayed somebody's kinsmen, they would come after you and they would exact revenge and it wouldn't be an eye for an eye. It would be, you took out my family member, I'm gonna take out your family. You took out my family, I'm gonna take out your tribe. You took out my tribe, I'm gonna wipe out your city. And so forth, so it escalates. And to prevent that from happening in the Germanic tradition, if you, sl if you slew somebody, killed them in battle, you would pay uh, a monetary recompense. And he does not do that. So he's lawless. He doesn't recognize the rules of war even. This is in war you would pay wear guilt, right? You would pay compensate because there's a recognition of loss and also recognition that if there's no way of, of recompense, there's no way of stopping the bloodlust and the desire for revenge for the slain man by his uh, relatives. And he says, it says, no counselor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands. All were endangered, young and old, were hunted down by that dark death shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam on their errands. So he takes over Herat. So Herat, the symbol of civilization known the world over, is now emptied and is what, what uh, the poet now calls a wallstead. It's just a walls. There's nothing in it. It's just empty walls. So it's been decimated. And at that point, uh, the Beowulf, towards the end of this, 180, this section, he says, the almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world was unknown to them. Who's he commenting on here? The shieldings. The men who live here, they didn't know about God. These were pagans. I'll backtrack a little bit here. He says, these were hard times, breath, line 170, breathtaking for the prince of the shieldings, powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. That was their way. Their heathenish hope Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. Romans 1 stuff. They knew, even though they worshipped idols, they knew that there was a judge behind all of that. Because they, they knew there was an almighty. If you look at Romans 1, that beginning passage, it talks about people being without excuse for they, they know that there is a God, they recognize his power, they recognize justice, and yet they um, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. That's the Beowulf comments, poets on them, and he's almost echoing Romans 1 here. That was their, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. Oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So as I say, it's a Christian poet commenting on a pagan culture and talking about the, the despair of cultures that don't know God and face nonetheless the reality of evil. So that's the saying. Interesting. An epic. It says if you take Beowulf and stick it as an epic alongside the, the epics of the Greeks and the Romans, or even Dante, it is a very different color and flavoring. It's clearly a Christian poet, but the setting is not. And so Dante, we just read his uh, Divine Comedy, at least bits of it. It's just clearly a pagan, uh, a Christian poem. It's taken uh, ancient uh, Greek and Latin legends and it's woven them in with Christians one but there's basically a, a Christian synthesis that's gone on there in the medieval period here we have no synthesis it's a Christian commenting on a pagan world from a distance saying how benighted that world was how lost they were 
and yet how God, even in the midst of that, provided a comforter and sent him to rescue the people. And he sent them, he sent the man, by the way, to die for them. Also interesting. And very uh, uh, telling. And then at that point, where, where he just left off saying, blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace, such a one as he comes forth. And that man is this man, Beowulf, who was sent as a comfort. Now he's introduced again. So we got the back and forth, right? So it begins with a description of the good kings and yet a brief mention of a time of desolation and yet the Lord sends a comforter. And then it goes back and describes the building of Hurat, this uh, symbol of civilization and blessing, and then brings into the discussion this horrible creature, Grendel, who's a descendant of Cain, and then talks about he has, he has absolutely destroyed Hurat and the, and the Danes, and they are in despair, and now comes the hero. Now comes the hero. Line 190. So that trouble time continued, woe that never stopped, steady affliction for half Dane's son. Too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by the terror. When he heard about Grendel, Hujalak's Thane was on home ground over in Yatland, over in South Sweden. That's when he heard about it. There was no one else like him alive. In his day, he was the mightiest man on earth, high-born and powerful. He ordered a boat that would ply the waves. He announced his plan to sail the Swan's Road and seek out that king. By the way, the Swan's Road, uh, this is a reference to the sea. This is a figure of speech characteristic of Anglo-Saxon poetry called a kenning. A swan's road is the sea. It's a metaphor, stock metaphor there. Uh, ribs are a bone cage. It's a, here it's a swan's, here it's a swan's road. Sometimes it's the whale road, the path where they swim. So it's a, just a poetic way of, uh, and these, are, these kennings are used regularly. But he announced his plan to seek out that king, the famous prince, who needed defenders. Nobody tried to keep him from going. No elder denied him, dear as he was to them. Instead, they inspected omens and spurred his ambition to go, whilst he moved about like the leader he was enlisting men, the best he could find with 14 others. The warrior boarded the boat as captain, a canny pilot among coast and currents. And now he goes, on he goes, And I will have to move on a little bit so I don't uh, lose uh, the first day and uh, get to the battle itself. Um, uh, pick it up. Where shall I pick it up? Uh, middle of the dialogue there, line 409. Uh, he's, uh, 407, rather. Beowulf spoke. Greetings. To Hrothgar, I am Hujalak's kinsman, one of his hall troop. When I was younger, I had great triumphs. Then news of Grendel, hard to ignore, reached me at home. Sailors brought stories of the plight you suffer in this legendary hall. How it lies deserted. Empty and useless once the evening light hides itself under heaven's dome. So every elder and experienced councilman among my people supported my resolve to come here to you, King Hrothgar, because all knew of my awesome strength. They had seen me boltered in the blood of enemies when I battled and bound five beasts, raided a troll nest, and in the night sea slaughtered sea brutes. I have suffered extremes and avenged the yats. Their enemies brought it upon themselves. I devastated them. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Settle the outcome in single combat. Let me say something about that, the single combat. In the um, Christian era, you will have seen jousting where knights come. And so for the uh, trial by combat, 
This is the means by which this age understood God's providence to work out. That God would, would uh, grant the victory, not to the strongest man, but to the one who is the most uh, virtuous, the one who is most godlike in his character. That's the one, and so a trial by combat would be a way of allowing God's work through, nonetheless through the martial means of combat. And so he, he decides he, although he is a man, is going to fight Grendel hand to hand. A little grappling for the MMA out there, a little, right? And we're gonna find that uh, Beowulf, but Beowulf is not an ordinary man, he's the greatest of men, and he has already battled not only against men, but beasts, five at once, in fact, and he went to a troll's nest and defeated them. Trolls are not things that men can defeat. And also went down into the, uh, under the water and fought the sea beast. So he's a monster, he's a, an extraordinary figure. And he also uh, uh, made an epic swim. Uh, the way uh, Beowulf is uh, cognate for the word bear, by the way. So he's a bear-like man. Maybe he himself is uh, not even exactly a man. There's something more than him about, uh, about him than that. But he says, I've extruffered, uh, now I mean to be a match for Grendel, settle the outcome in single combat. And so my request, O King of Bright Danes, dear Prince of the Shieldings, friend of the people, and their ring of defense, my one request is that you won't refuse me, who have come this far, the privilege of purifying Hurot, with my own men to help me and nobody else. I've heard moreover that the monster scorns in his reckless way to use weapons. Therefore, to heighten Hujalak's fame and gladden his heart, I hereby renounce sword and the shelter of the broad shield, the heavy war board. Hand to hand is how it will be a life and death fight with the fiend. Think of how when, uh, and again, this is a Christian theme to some degree, or at least a biblical theme, is that God doesn't need the strength of numbers. In fact, he whittles down his army so that they are lesser. And often you'll find that the Davids defeating the Goliaths, a small number of, of Israelites defeating a larger host and so forth because they're faithful. S same sort of theme here. It's the power of God that will allow him to prevail. Yes. Hujalak. Hujalak is uh, his uh, liege lord. The king. The king. Sorry? He's not yet the king of his own men. He's just a young man. He's come across with Hujalak. Hujalak. So he's just, he's this um, warrior, uh, but he's still a young man. He's, he's not yet established himself. He's still earning his spurs. Yes. Hrothgar is the king. There are two kings. One's the Thane and the other's the king. Well, uh, oh gosh, who's, who's here, here? So, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, oh no, you don't have the same version I've got here. Um, so Hrothgar uh, and um, is of the Danish line and Hujalak is a brother of Hrothgar, I believe, or he's one of the, so, so Hujalak is of the, of the Yats. So Hrothgar is of the Danes and Hujalak's of the Yats. And the Danish king is actually the king over that. So this is a, like a duke or something like that equivalent. There's a, an alliance. So he's his servant, but, and he's one of the Yatish folks. It's a little confusing. I don't know if you have a little table, an ancestral table at the outset of, the, of your poem. I've got one here. There's a little genealogy and mention of the tribes. I realize it's a little bit uh, confusing there. But that's what he, he asks for. And he says, whichever one death fells must deem it a just judgment by God. There you go. So this will be a trial by combat, hand to hand, and the outcome of it will clearly be pointed to God. And he's convinced that he will do it because he's been brought for this purpose. 
even though this monster is, is more powerful than he, but because God has ordained it, it will happen. And everyone will, as I say, deem it a just judgment by God. If Grendel wins, it will be a gruesome day. He will glut himself on the yachts in the war hall, swoop without fear on that flower of manhood as on others before. Then my face won't be there to be covered in death. He will carry me away as he goes to ground, gorged and bloodied. He will run gloating with my raw corpse and feed on it alone in a cruel frenzy, fouling his moor nest. No need then for lament, to lament for long or lay out my body. If the battle takes me, send back this breast webbing that we lend fashion. So the, the, the chain mail that you have on, your, on the uh, cover of your books. If that happens. And Hrothgar accepts this and accepts that he will fight for them. The offer of fidelity here and the oath that was taken, he accepts his offer to be his servant and, uh, and he thereby bonds him to the vassal. So there's a bonding ceremony, then there's a feast at Hirat. I'll go over that, but the, I'll skip over it rather. But in that feast, it's interesting, there's a little bit of uh, young men and a little bit of uh, trash talking going on here. You know, aren't you the Beowulf? It said that you are, you know, I think that you were, you say that you swam that great distance, but I think it wasn't you. I think it was the other guy. You, you didn't do this. And it, so that, this is called flighting. In, in Anglo-Saxon uh, literature, the, before they start fighting it, there's, there's the word fighting. As I say, the trash talking. That's just the, probably they're just getting amped up. It's, it happens to this day. So it starts, you can see it on the hockey night in Canada. It starts with the chirping, as you say, starts with that. And then they, it, the blood starts getting up, but that, and that's the prelude. And it's a sort, form of assault. And then physical combat follows after that. So that's what's going on here. He's flighting him. He's, he's diminishing his reputation. And Beowulf uh, humiliates him. But this character, his name is Unferth. And I just mentioned that because we're going to see how Unferth treats Beowulf differently after the battle. But before the battle, he disputes that he is this great man. Runs him down. And Unferth uh, is a bit like a Grim a worm tongue type of character, if that means anything to you from the Lord of the Rings. But I will skip over that and let's come to the fight itself. But just remember Unferth and this uh, rather unsavory uh, uh, interlude, but he says, the fact is, Unferth, if you were truly as keen or courageous as you claim to be, Grendel would never have got away with such unchecked heros, uh, atrocity. But he knows he never need be in dread of your blade making mizzle of his blood, because you're a coward. So it's back, a little whack, back and forth. Okay, so now, Beowulf decides that he is going to sleep in the mead hall, where the attacks come. He and his men are going to sit there and pretend to be asleep and wait. And so they're lying and stalking him. And out of the dark comes uh, Grendel. Uh, comment before we get to that 696. They knew the way it was before, how often the Danes had fallen prey to death in the meat hall. But the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom for the weather yachts. So this is how it was before, but the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom for the weather yachts. Beowulf and his tribe. Through the strength of one, they all prevailed. They would crush their enemy and come through its triumph and gladness. The truth is clear. Almighty God rules over mankind and always has. So again, Christian poet talking about pagan in the pagan world, God has always ruled over the nations. They haven't recognized who the ruler was, but he's always been in their midst. This isn't a, a reinterpretation of history. It's a, the Christian interpretation of history. God has always been the almighty. He has always ruled amongst the nations. They haven't recognized it. Now we do recognize it, the Beowulf poet would say, but they didn't know. And yet God still worked out. So it's, it's a way of understanding history as the theater of God's providence. Anyway, back to the story. Then out of the night came the shadow stalker. 
stealthy and swift. The hall guards were slack, asleep at their post, all except one. It was widely understood that as long as God disallowed it, the fiend could not bear them to his shadow born. One man, however, was in fighting mood, awake and on edge, spoiling for action. Uh, I'll read it. In, in off the moors, down through the mist bands, God cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roamed forth, hunting for a prey in the high hall. Under the cloud murk, he moved toward it until it shone above him, a sheer keep of fortified gold. Nor was it the first time he had scouted the grounds of Hrothgar's dwelling, although never in his life, before or since, did he find harder fortune or hall defenders. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bawn. The iron brace door turned on its hinge when his hands touched it. So it's got, if you think about it, I don't know if you've ever seen these old doors, it's wooden, but it's got metal along it to strengthen it. You can't break this door down. He just grabs it and pulls it off the hinge, just rips it right off to give the strength of the, of the beast. He ripped open, he, it, it, when his ra then his rage boiled over, he ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood, pacing the length of the pattern floor with his loathsome tread, while a baleful light, flame more than light, flared from his eyes. He saw many men in the mansion sleeping, a ranked company of kinsmen and warriors quartered together, and his glee was demonic, picturing the mayhem. Before morning, he would rip life from limb and devour them, feed on their flesh. But his fate that night was due to change. His days of ravening had come to an end. Mighty and canny, Hujalak's kinsman was keenly watching for the first move the monster would make. Nor did the creature keep him waiting. He but struck suddenly and started in. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, right between the joints, rip, like biting right through the joints bolted down his blood and gorged on him in lumps, just like the uh, Cyclops did, leaving him utterly lifeless, eaten up hand and foot, venturing closer. His talon was raised, a talon like an eagle. So he's got claws. Raised to attack Beowulf where he lay on the bed, he was bearing in with open claw when the he alert heroes come back and arm lock forestalled him utterly. So he takes his hand and then twists it behind his back. The captain of evil discovered himself in a hand grip harder than anything he had ever encountered in any man on the face of the earth. Every bone in his body quailed and recoiled, but he could not escape. He was desperate to flee to his den and hide with the devil's litter. For in all his days, he had never been clamped or cornered like this. Then Hujalak's trusty retainer recalled his bedtime speech, sprang to his feet and got a firm hold. Fingers were bursting, the monster backtracking, the man overpowering. The dread of the land was desperate to escape, to take a roundabout road and flee to his lair in the fens. The latching power in his fingers weakened. It was the worst trip the terror monger had taken to Hirot, and now the timbers trembled and sang. A hall session that harrowed every Dane inside the stockade. Stumbling in fury, the two contenders crashed through the building. The hall clattered and hammered, but somehow survived the onslaught and kept standing. It was handsomely structured, a sturdy frame braced with the best of blacksmith's work inside and out. The story goes that as the pair struggled, mead benches were smashed and sprung off the floor, gold fittings and all. Before then, no shielding elder would believe there was any power or person upon earth capable of wrecking their horn-rigged hull, unless the burning embrace of a fire engulfed it in flame, then an extraordinary wail arose and bewildering fear came over the Danes, everyone felt it, who heard that cry as it echoed off the wall. 
a God-cursed scream and strain of catastrophe, the howl of the loser, the lament of the hell surf keening his wound. He was overwhelmed, manacled tight by the man who of all men was foremost and strongest in the days of this life. But the Earl Troop's leader was not inclined to allow his caller to depart alive. He did not consider that life of much account to anyone anywhere. Time and again, Beowulf's warriors worked to defend their Lord's life, laying about them as best they could with their ancestral blades. So they, he has forsworn weapons. He has no weapon, but they've got them. And now they're coming to cut Grendel down. When they joined the struggle, there was something they could not have known at the time, that no blade on earth, no blacksmith's art could ever damage their demon opponent. He had conjured the harm from the cutting edge of every weapon. So there's sorcery at work here. Edged weapons can't harm him. He's not afraid of men because men will need weapons to kill him, and yet no weapons even can harm him. So he's very bold. And Beowulf has forsworn weapons because he wants God to be honored in the deed, and that is exactly what will happen here. But then he who had harrowed the hearts of men with pain and affliction to former times and had given offense also to God found that his bodily powers failed him. The monster's body, as long as either lived, he was hateful to the other monster's whole body was in pain. A tremendous wound appeared on his shoulder. Sinews split and the bone lappings burst. Beowulf was granted the glory of winning. What's just happened? He's ripped the arm off the shoulder, taken it and pulled it right off. So that right. And what do you think he does with the arm? He sticks it on the wall in the Hurot. Trophy! And then they go back to Hurot, and there's a feast, and there's a celebration, and there's a song. And they are going to sing now of the deeds of Beowulf and deeds of heroes gone by, but the blessing of God now. And they start singing of Sigmund and so forth. Um, and they're going on, and at this point, uh, Hrothgar comes and he speaks, and he sees the, wall, the arm of Grendel on the wall and the talon, and he says this, line uh, 927, first and foremost, let the Almighty Father be thanked for this sight. I suffered a long harrowing by Grendel, but the heavenly shepherd can work his wonders always and everywhere. Not long since, it seemed I would never be granted the slightest solace or relief from any of my burdens. The best of houses glittered and reeked and ran with blood. This one worry outweighed all others, a constant distress to counselors entrusted with defending the people's forts from assault by monsters and demons. Now think about this here. Hrothgar is called a good king. And yet the king himself has not gone out to defend his people. Why has he not done this? He's called Hrothgar, the king of the Danes, is a good king. He built Herat. He's sworn oaths to defend his people, and yet he has not himself gone out in battle to face Grendel. Is he a coward? Is he wise? The comment is not being made here, he's, other than that he's called a good king. I would say he's pretty wise. If you're an old man, you don't go out and fight Grendel because you're not going to live. And then the, then the people will, will be without a king. That means they'll have, no, they'll have no authority or rule and that the savagery of Grendel will then destroy the entire kingdom. There will be no king to defend them against human invaders either. So they'll have, in addition to the problem of Grendel, they will find themselves kingless. 
and then other tribes will come in and totally wipe out. The, there will be no more kingdom. It's gone. So he is wise in not engaging with Grendel. He he had no he didn't know who to pray to even. Well, he was he was praying to the pagan gods. Didn't do anything. But now he's been delivered from that. But that's uh, the reason I I mention that is later on when we come to the third encounter with Beowulf and the dragon, we find Beowulf as an old king and this old king goes out to battle one last time. Is he wise in doing this or is he foolish? Because if he loses his life in battle and he does not have an heir, who's going to prevent the other armies from coming in and destroying his kingdom? So the, the battle of a young man who has nothing to lose other than his life and the battle of a king who has not only his own fate, but the fate of his whole people. And there are, they are different situations. It's an interesting point here, I think. But he said, this one worry outweighed all the others. A constant distress to counselors entrusted with defending the people's forts from assault by monsters and demons. But now a man with the Lord's assistance has accomplished something none of us could manage before now with, for all our efforts. Whoever she was who brought forth this flower of mankind, manhood rather, if she is alive, Beowulf's mother, that woman can say that in her labor, the Lord of ages bestowed a grace on her. So now, Beowulf, I adopt you in my heart as a dear son. Nourish and maintain this new connection. You noblest of men, there'll be nothing you'll want for. No worldly goods that won't be yours. I have honored smaller achievements, recognized warriors not nearly as worthy, lavish rewards on the less deserving. But you have made yourself immortal by your glorious action. May the Lord of God of Ages continue to keep and requite you well. And he gives him an ancient sword for this as well. An ancient sword is presented here by Half Dane's son. Uh, he is given a gold standard, so this is like 1020, a gold standard is a, vic a victory gift. An embroidered banner, also breast mail, so breast mail to protect him in battle. And a helmet and a sword carried high that was both precious object and token of armor. By the way, in Beowulf's day and in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, the best swords are the old swords because the old swords were forged well and they have not broken in battle. Sometimes they're blessed swords and so forth. These are like uh, they're like heirlooms, but at the same time they're actually superior. So the, uh, we tend to think that the newest things are the best things. In their age, the best things are the things that have endured the test of time. And that goes for character and that goes for uh, stories, etc., all that. So there's a, a, a reverence for uh, the good things that endure, as opposed to the new things that will uh, soon pass away. But he, he gives them these gifts, and th so again, gifts as a sign of, of uh, favoring him for his heroism. And then there's a, this long extended poem once again, a song is sung by the king's poet. Uh, this would be a shop uh, S-C-O-P, but it's pronounced shop. The poets who function in the Anglo-Saxon court in the similar way that we saw in the Greek epics, they also did. There's a singer in the hall. Uh, and telling the saga of Finn and his sons. Now we hear stories from a different, uh, of heroes of ages past. Celebrating heroism. Celebrating virtue. Celebrating justice celebrating the goods of the past, but now there's been a connection to that in this day. And then when the poem is over, a pleasant murmur started on the benches. Benches stewards did the rounds with wine and splendid jugs, and Wealthio came to sit in her golden crown between two good men, uncle and nephew, each one of whom still trusted the other. And then forthright unferth, admired by all for his mind and courage, though under a cloud for killing his brothers, reclined towards the king, reclined near the king. Um, at that point, I think I'm going to have to pick this up next time, uh, when just when all is gone well and there's applause in the hall and there's delight and there's a sense that the evil is gone, 
the second attack begins from a creature that they had not hitherto known. And as I say, far worse than Grendel is the mother bereft of her son. And she is an evil hag. We will come to her next time though, but pick it up there and we'll, we'll deal with the second and the third trials uh, next class, okay?